And if I guess for 17, I'm going to guess way up here that's wrong. From this seven points, I want to have a curve. Fine, I'd like to have a curve. From this set of points, the problem is I have this outlier point. Putting a line, the best line here is too simple because I should first get rid of that outlier and then put a different line. So all of these are doing the best regression line fitting for some of them. Overfitting says the model is too specific. So here's an example where I have a set of points and I decide my regression is going to be this big curve. That's too specific. For these points align with the underfitting because that's too simple, and what I'd like is to have a curve. So we'll talk more about this regression later. I'm going to skip Google Translate, and now I'm going to go to the first chance for some of you to win some prizes. Okay, everybody ready? All right, first chance for prizes. I'm going to give away, I think I'll give away three prizes for this one. Okay. I am going to describe to you, does everybody know what a scam is? When somebody tries to get money out of you. Actually, Nigeria is famous for scams. So you guys should be very, very good at this one. Okay. I know it's a and I've never been successful. Okay, all right. This is going to be a scam about a soccer match prediction. But I want you to know, know it's first it's a scam, and second it uses big data. And think about that big data. Okay, think about the big data part. So here is the story. Let's say that you live in a town or every or city where every weekend there are five soccer matches. Okay? Five soccer matches each weekend, and assume there's no draws. Everything is a win or a loss. Okay? Five soccer matches. On Friday, you receive an email from someone named And she gets them right, all of them. So that seems okay. That seems pretty good, but not that impressive. Five games predicted correctly. But the same thing happens the next weekend. There are five games. You get an email from her on Friday, and she predicts all of them correctly. And maybe some of those games were surprises, right? Maybe the teams that won weren't the ones you expect to win. Okay. So, now comes the third weekend. You get an email from her like, again, yeah. and she predicts all five of the winners correctly. So now three weekends in a row, she's predicted all five winners correctly. In the engagement, she got right. Friday, you get an email from Sally, and this time she says, would you like the predictions? Did you do it? Why not?
For the very much, I don't know. Every possible thing that can happen in the games. And then at the very end, there'll be some people who she says the correct predictions to. Does that make sense? All right, here comes where you can win the prize. Yep. No. The it's not a particular set. At the end, she just remembers which one got the correct. So let me go to the next thing. Here's the, here's what I want you to do. I want you to tell me how many contacts must Sally start with on week one. Start with a certain number of contacts. She's going to send them for all different predictions to different people. How many does she have to start with on the first one to make sure that after all 15 games, she has 100 people who got the right prediction? So I want her to have 100 people at the end. That she can make the offer to based on getting 15 predictions correct. Remember, there's only winners and losers, no draws. So each game has two possible outcomes. Does everybody understand the question? Okay, so I'm going to wait up here and you can come up here and show me your answer. And the first three people to show me the correct answer will get to take a prize, a bag. No books or sunglasses. You can definitely talk to each other as you try to work it out. It's just a lot of arithmetic. All right, go.
2,768. But then you multiply by 100 because you want 100 people to get that that outcome. You multiply it by 100. That's correct. Yep. Yes. And two to the 15. Two to the power of 15 times 100. Yep. Yep. Okay, and I can see that the little notebooks are the most popular item here in Nigeria. Different places, different items are popular. Do you like sunglasses here? I hope so, because I have a lot of sunglasses. You like them? They say Stanford on them? Okay, all right. Okay, okay. I want to talk a little bit about data privacy. So data privacy is a significant concern in some sectors. There's a bunch of different aspects of data privacy. How many of you have heard of Edward Snowden? Edward Snowden, seen the movie? So, Edward Snowden discovered that the United States was collecting data about like 80% of the citizens. And he made that public. So, he had, it was actually illegal what the United States was against the law, but it was also against the law for him to make it public because he had agreed to work with confidentiality. So he now lives in Russia. He will be uh, arrested if he comes to the United States. But what the United States said is that they weren't collecting data, they were collecting metadata, which is data about data. So they said, we were not listening to your phone calls, we were just collecting the data about who you called, how often, and how long you talked. Most people think that is still an invasion of privacy for the government to know who you call, even if they're not listening to your call. And they did the same thing with email. They said, we weren't looking to get the content of your email, just who you emailed and how often. Most people thought that was also an invasion of privacy. So that's a case where individual data is being collected without it being known. But there's other cases where people collect data legally but use it in questionable ways, ethically. So in the United States, there's the department store, a big mega, mega store called Target. Do you have mega stores here, like hypermarkets, where you can buy everything? You know, Walmart or Costco? Okay. So you can buy food and groceries, you can buy food and clothing and household goods. Do they collect your data? Yes, I'm sure they collect your data. I'm sure when you go to the store, do, you, do they have loyalty cards? Loyalty cards are all about collecting your data. That's why they have the loyalty cards. So they know it's you and they can collect your data. And they use that data for various things, including advertising. So Target is the name of a big hypermarket in the United States. And the Target hypermarket decided that they would like to know when their customers are pregnant. Because then they can market they can advertise specifically things for pregnancy. But they looked at their data and they said, I don't have enough information to know when people are pregnant. Maybe they'll buy special clothing, but otherwise I'm not sure. But then they did the following experiment. They took all of their data of people's purchases. And in that data, they do know when somebody has a baby. When someone has a baby, they'll buy a crib, a car seat, certain types of baby formula, maybe diapers. They can tell very clearly when someone has a baby. So they took their buying patterns and they took the people who had had babies and they looked back at the previous six months at everything they bought. And they used a machine learning model from the data to predict when people were pregnant. Again, they took the data from when they knew they had a baby, this is in the past, looked back at their buying patterns and created a model of what pregnant people shop for. And they were so confident of that that they started sending advertisements to people's homes based on their buy-in, saying, congratulations, you're pregnant. 
just based on their machine learning data model, and they were very accurate. They even sent it to one person's home, to a girl, and her father said, you're pregnant? And she said, I'm not pregnant, but you know what she was? Target was right. But people got very upset at that. It's a big invasion of privacy for a store to decide they know when you're pregnant based on when you lie. So they stopped doing that. There's another example also about privacy. I don't know about here, but sometimes in the US, if you're not careful and you're on Facebook, and you buy something, it will actually advertise on your Facebook page that you bought it. So somebody, very stupid person, bought an engagement ring for his girlfriend on Facebook and it posted that he bought it. And she saw it and it ruined the surprise. So you know what he did? This is very American. He sued Facebook for emotional damages. <laughs> the other thing that can happen, and this is a really serious matter, and this is related to the public health database, is that sometimes you can deduce things about individual people from anonymous data. So this is again a true story. In the state of Massachusetts in the United States, some hospitals published some data for people to use for research. It was data about people who had come to the hospital. But they took out their names and their social security numbers. They removed all the identifying information. They published the data, and within two hours, people identified the mayor of the city of Boston in that data. Okay. How did they do that? It turns out that certain sets of features that are anonymous, when taken together, can boil it down to one person. It turns out if you take someone's gender, and their age, and their postal code, that is enough to get to one person, and that's how they found the Boston mayor, and they saw his health record was public. That was very upsetting, awesome. So privacy is a significant issue in big data in society. Okay, we're just about finished here. I'm just going to talk very briefly, really fast, about languages, systems, and platforms. This is usually mostly interesting to working engineers, so I'll go fast. Spreadsheets, very personal and powerful. We're going to use spreadsheets soon. That's, they're good for almost everything, but not extremely big data. There are programming languages with big data support. One of them is called R. How many people have heard of R? It has powerful statistical features. It used to be the most popular language for big data, but now Python is more popular. Because Python has a general purpose language, but it also has all the things that R has. There are relational database management systems, also called RDMS or SQL systems, long standing, 40 years old, reliable, efficient, powerful query processing. They work for all the truly extreme data sizes or highly unstructured data. Okay? There are things called no SQL systems. Those are sort of specialized systems for distributed processing. There are specialized languages on scalable systems, MapReduce, Hadoop, Spark. We can talk about these offline if you're interested. Systems for data preparation, systems for data visualization. Now, people often ask about data processing in the cloud. You get that question a lot. If you are a big enterprise and you have a big data project, using the cloud is a good idea if you have enough money. Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure will give you data storage, data processing. They will give you machine learning libraries and integration with visualization systems. Lots of companies are now putting their data in the cloud for this reason. Last thing, people ask, this is a question I think we're going to get, how big is this? Well, first of all, 
big data doesn't have to be big, but I want to give you a little bit of an idea of how much data there is in the world. So I'm going to start with the complete works of William Shakespeare. Everybody know William, the famous playwright? Hamlet, Romeo and Juliet, all that. All of his whole life work, one of the most famous writers of all time, is five megabytes. I'm compressed. Five megabytes. All right, that's the baseline of complete words of William Shakespeare. The average individual in the world today, and you're probably all above average, has 50 gigabytes or 10,000 Shakespeare. That's each person in the world on average. The USA Library of Congress is not really a library, it's a digital repository of all the books, all the court records, everything ever in the United States. Digital form, 10 terabytes or 2 million Shakespeare. Okay, these numbers are getting bigger. Everybody ready for the next one? Upload to Facebook daily. More than the USA Library of Congress. What do you think? What's after terabyte? Petabyte. One petabyte or 200 million Shakespeare's uploaded to Facebook every single day. Can you imagine what Shakespeare would think of that? And then produced by humanity every day. Who knows what's after petabyte? Exabyte. Two and a half exabytes or 500 trillion Shakespeare of data is being produced every single day. Most of that data is not very interesting. But size is not that important. I actually don't like that question, how big is it? The tools and techniques we're going to learn apply to data of all sizes, and you can have big insights from small or medium data. We have a course at Stanford, the name of the course is Small Data. So the course is actually about how you can have insights when your data is small. So maybe some applications need 20 star servers in the cloud, but a laptop with Python, SQL, or simple spreadsheets often can do a very good job at data analysis. And I hope I can convince you of that today. So here's what we're going to do in the rest of the course. Everybody ready to work hard? Yeah. Okay. Yes. We are going to start after this like, with data analysis using spreadsheets. So even if you think you know how to use spreadsheets, you will learn those things, I promise. Then we're going to do data visualization using spreadsheets, and then advanced data visualization using a tool called Tableau, which is an excellent, very fun data visualization tool. For many people, that one, Tableau, is their favorite part of the whole course. Then we're going to learn about relational databases and basic SQL. Okay? Then we're going to learn about Python for data analysis and visualization. We don't need to know any of these things. We're going to start from the beginning to each one. We're going to do machine learning, relation classification and clustering, and then do machine learning using Python. Data mining algorithms using SQL or Python. We'll see, that might take us a whole time. If that's a lot of material, as you can imagine. If there's extra time, we might do advanced SQL, we might do more on correlation and causation, and we might do the R language. We can see how things progress and what people are most interested in. I'm prepared to do all of this. Now, one other thing I wanted to do was color code. The ones that are green are very hands-on. I'm going to be typing, you're going to be typing, I'm going to be getting you assignments that you can do when the first people get them, they get some prizes, all of those green ones. The ones that are blue are a little less hands-on, a little more talking, okay? But you should be ready for that. So, um, I want to, this is, I'm done and we're going to take a break, but I do want to say that after the break, we're going to be using the spreadsheet. We're going to be doing the session on sheet, and you should all have done the instructions in getting started with Google Sheets. If anybody has it, I'm going to show you, there is a website. Professorwinner.org. 
Has everybody seen the professorwinner.org website? Yes. No. It's www.professorwinner.org, but I feel like my internet is not working. Who was helping me with the internet? I D K. Not working. Is there another internet that works? Give me a moment here.
and four before the next session. So sign in there and go to your seat. If you want to get your team break, you can get it outside. If you want to remain here, remain on your seat. But you can check in on any of those central computers and so on. Because your attendance stands, you have a party, you want to get your attendance before you are qualified for the certificate.